So the Voldoon Mount Farm is not a particularly new concept to many of you watching this video, but with how many people do undertake this farm, it's very common to see people doing it in very inefficient ways. And as a result, I've decided to make this video for you all. Now, this video is going to discuss many of the ways in which you can optimize the Voldoon Mount Farm, but please do bear in mind that this is very much best case scenario and in the real world it may not be possible to achieve all of these circumstances. Now if you are one of the people who are watching this video and do not know what the Voldoon Mount Farm is, we will be briefly covering that first, but please do bear in mind that while we will be providing all the information that you need in order to be able to take part in the farm, this video is going to primarily focus on the ways of improving the doing of the farm as opposed to the farm itself. But let's begin. So the Voldoon Mount Farm is a mass mob instant respawn farm that takes place in northwestern Voldoon. And as the name suggests, primarily we are here in the hopes of getting the mount that is zone specific to Voldoon. This mount is the captured dune scavenger. And with it being a zone drop, it has even opportunity to drop from any mob within the zone of Voldoon. And as a result, you simply want a farm that can provide the highest number of kills per hour. Now, to that end, we are going to be farming the Sethrak that I used for a world quest in the area shown on the map. And we are going to be optimizing our group with getting as many kills per hour in as possible. Now, beyond the mount, we do have a variety of other drops that are potentially going to drop for us. These include a wide variety of BOE epics, which are 350 item level, and at the time of this recording still holds some value, but it is gradually deteriorating over time, with the exception of the t reboot, which is popular as a transmog item as well as a current item for endgame. We also have the steady and consistent gold aspects of this farm, which are twofold. First of all, they are going to be in the form of the grey items that will vendor for large amounts of gold and you will be getting quite a lot of them. But even better than that, we are going to be getting a very large number of cloth thanks to the fact that these mobs are humanoid. Now, this cloth is going to be both the tide spray linen and the deep sea satin that are the native cloths to BFA and you will be getting them at such a high rate that there isn't really another farm for these cloths that can compete in terms of cloths per hour. So the general accepted strategy for doing this farm is to use two groups of four people so a total of eight people that are doing the farm for you and this is the highest amount of people that are able to tag the mobs without people being unable to loot which is why it's structured into the two groups of four. Within these groups of four, you're going to need at least one monk who is going to place a statue to gather all of the mobs that are being pulled by the designated pullers of the groups who will run around and gather the mobs and bring them back to a centralized location, which is usually placed around this sort of rock face that you see in the video. Now, that is the generally accepted practice and it is perfectly fine. However, it can be improved upon if you are more specific in terms of the people that you can bring, both in terms of class composition and also the specs that they are playing. So let's go into our class composition. So our groups, in the, my experience, the best way to optimize your groups is to have two identical groups in terms of the roles that are being fulfilled. There is the statues, which are going to be monks, and that is as simple as that. No one else has access to any kind of mechanic that works the same way as the Black Ox statue. And with me saying that these do want to be identical groups, this is the only point of contention. And that is that some people believe that you can do just as well with one monk as you can with two. But personally, the two statues, I believe, covers not only for downtime on a statue if one dies or needs to be replaced because it times out, but also it allows you to cover a wider area with the taunts that the statues provide, which means that you're simply less likely to have mobs escaping from the aggro range of the statues. If you do 
want to drop a monk in favor of something else, then I would highly recommend that you have an extra puller. And that is the next thing that we are going to discuss. Now, your pullers are quite variable in terms of the class and specs that can be used. Any class, in principle, can be used for this job. However, there are certainly ones that are preferential over others. So, our top tier pullers are going to be Boomkins. Now, this is simply due to the fact that they have such a wide array of utility. They have a very long range in order to be able to pull the mobs. They have movement speed abilities that are going to make it quicker for them, as well as the ability to displace to get away from things that might slow them down. They also have the ability to chip in and help with the task of the killers that are going to be the last role that we discuss, and essentially do not lack in any way, shape or form for any of the aspects that make a good puller. Now, you will notice that in this video we do have two boomkins because we were extremely lucky, but this is one of the ways in which it is okay to vary your experience of this farm. If you aren't able to get two boomkins to be your pullers, there are certainly a wide variety of other people that can do the job. And they are going to basically be anyone who can abide by the following principles. You're going to want a character who is able to travel fast, be that consistently on a mount without being dazed and knocked off or fast in terms of using movement speed abilities. You're going to want a character who can do range pulling, or who is able to run on his mount again without being dismounted so that he can body pull, but at a higher speed. Now, this is pretty much exclusively going to be tanks as they don't get dazed, but tanks are suboptimal by comparison to a ranged puller, simply because it means the mobs that have already been pulled are going to be running a larger distance and have a higher chance of resetting and running back to their original positions while evading all attempts to re-pull them. If you can't get anything better than a tank, a tank will suffice, but they are not the primary option. Anything with a ranged pulling ability and ideally a few movement speed abilities is going to be a better option, so anything like mages or hunters are going to do just fine. Shaman again is not a bad option. Pretty much anything can perform this role. I would try and stay clear from things that have only melee abilities. Things like warriors are pretty low down on the priority list. They can do the job if they really are required to do and it's all you can get. But you are better off trying to assign them to a different role if at all possible or asking them to come on an alt that is more well suited for doing the farm. And speaking of our last role for the farm, we have the killers. Now, these are the people that are going to stand at the statues, pull in all of the mobs that are running nearby and mass AoE them down. Now, again, there is definitely classes that do this better than others, but most classes will be able to do this as it is fundamentally just killing mobs. Now, the general consensus is that the best character to use for this is a demon hunter thanks to its obscene AoE damage and the fact that the more it kills, the quicker it's able to put out this damage through certain Azerite traits, and I am inclined to agree. In the video you are watching, I am actually using this Demon Hunter of mine to, to fulfill this role, and it works extremely well. The ability not only to consistently kill all of these mobs, the ability to also aggro mobs from range with both Taunt and Throw Glaive, and high mobility is only mirrored and matched by its potential in its capacity for self-sustain from the murder of these mobs through getting the soul orbs and also from its passive leech. This makes the demon hunter the standout top tier for performing this role in this farm. After the demon hunter, anything that has self-sustain and large amounts of consistent AoE will be able to suffice but this is one of the few roles that is somewhat gear dependent, so do bear that in mind. Of course, if you have a max level character that is 320 item level, he's going to do a lot worse than a max level character who is 420 item level. So if you have the option of a top tier, under geared character to perform this role, or a lower tier character who has got all of the gear in the world, that is probably the way to go. 
Second tier options for this roll include anything with persistent ground effect AoEs, so things like Warlocks or things particularly like Boomkins with their Starfall ability will also provide an excellent capacity to fulfil this roll. The only problem of course there being that they are the best option also for pulling. A lot of you I know who do gold farming will have druids for the purposes of doing all of your other farms and they can ultimately perform every role in this particular farm. So if you have a druid do not feel that you're unprepared you will be able to come and take part. Now with the issue of the group composition out of the way we're going to discuss the real big factor that can affect the amount of gold that you make from this farm and that is going to be the professions that you have and also the tools of the trade. So if you are using a max level character for performing of this farm, I highly recommend that you have tailoring on the character that you are performing the farm on and also that you have completed the tailoring tool of the trade. Now, if you have tailoring, you will have access to go and get the cloth scavenging trait from Northrend tailoring which just costs 5 gold and is achieved by visiting the vendor, sorry the trainer, in Old Dalaran in Northrend and just giving him the 5 gold and all of a sudden every mob in the game will drop more cloth for you than it would have done otherwise. Similarly, the tool of the trade provides a similar function in that it also increases the cloth that you acquire. Now in testing, I had both of these factors when I was undergoing the farm and a friend of mine was also taking part in the farm, so the exact same mob count over the same time looted, but without either of these two traits. And the number of cloth I received was approximately eight times that of what they did. Now, that is obviously a ludicrous amount of increase, and does mean that the consistent gold of this farm, which is the cloths, and quite frankly, given that the drop rate on everything else is so low, is going to make up the majority of gold that you make from this farm, it is very highly recommended that you put in the effort to get tailoring and the tool of the trade completed. The only other profession that I wish to mention is going to be enchanting. Now, it isn't imperative that the enchanting that you have is on the character you are performing the farm on, but it is certainly going to improve quality of life so you don't have to spend a lot of time posting things and logging in and out from one character to another. Now, Enchanting is going to be used for the destruction of an assortment of items not only that you are going to get dropped for you from this farm but also that you're going to be crafting with the cloths that you get from tailoring but we're going to go on to that more in just a moment. Now the reason that you want the enchanting on some character is that you are going to be disenchanting all of the greens that you get from this farm. If you would like you can sell these greens on the auction house but do bear in mind that these green items are going to be of the same level for requirements of what your character is that you are using. So this is only really viable if you're doing this on a 110 twink and happen to get speed gear dropped. Everything else you're going to be better off either disenchanting or using in the scrapper. Now, the enchanting that you are going to have is also recommended to be teamed with the tool of the trade that increases the amount of materials you get when disenchanting items. Now again this is fairly obvious but the main perk of this is the fact that you are simply going to get more in value of items to sell than you would if you didn't have this tool of the trade. In terms of the tool it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of gold in order to be able to acquire but it's going to be made its money's worth back in one run of this farm for about half an hour. Anything beyond that is pure profit. And finally we're on to our final optimization trick which is going to be what we do with what we get from this farm. Now at the end of this farm you're going to find yourself with ideally some BOE purples and or the mount which you are going to just straight up sell and that's fairly obvious but it is worth mentioning. Beyond that you are going to have acquired your cloths and your greens. Now all of the greens you get are probably going to want to go into the scrapper. Now this is because of the fact that the greens will be relatively slow shifting because they're in such high priority and low demand, but also because anyone who does buy them is going to be buying them to put in the scrapper themselves in order to acquire Expulsum. Now 
Expulsum is also going to be valuable to us with what we are going to do next in this process. Which is why I highly recommend any greens that you get from this farm or from the later steps that we're going to discuss go into the scrapper to acquire as much expulsum as you can. Now your next step is going to be converting the deep sea satins that you have acquired from this farm into embroidered deep sea satins. Now the embroidered deep sea satins are going to be used for another craft that we're going to be doing after our completion of this which is going to be the crafting of the embroidered deep sea bags. Now these bags have great value, I'll be popping them up onto the screen for you here, but it is subject to realm and of course your capacity to craft them. Now the acquisition of the ability to craft these bags is tied behind Tortolan rep, so do bear that in mind if you are using a character that has Tortolan maxed out, the rest of the acquisition is fairly easy with tier 1 coming from Naga drops, it's just a world drop off any of the Naga creatures in BFA. Then the other tier is going to be available from killing Zul. In my experience I have acquired this three times and it's dropped on three occasions so in my experience it's a 100% drop rate but that hasn't yet been confirmed so do bear that in mind. Now if you are able to craft these you are simply going to need the embroidered deep sea satins that you will have acquired from this farm and the expulsums that we have acquired from scrapping our greens. If you haven't completed any dungeons at max level you will also need to get yourself some hydro cores which at the time of recording have been replaced by tidal cores but your enchanter can convert them for you. This is one of the big perks of having your enchanter be the character that is doing the farm as it is able to do this conversion for you. Once you've crafted your bags the next step is going to be with our tide spray linen. Now you do want to check the value of tide spray linen on your realm before you follow this next step as I once followed the next step and used all of my linen only to find out that on my realm it was selling for 15 gold per linen. If that's the case of course just straight up sell your cloth but if you're like the majority of people then you are going to want to follow this next step which is to craft tide spray linen braces. Now these linen braces are going to be a low level green item and you're simply going to throw them into the scrapper to gather more expulsion. However if you are lucky you will have some of these bracelets proc blue. Now at this point it becomes highly valuable to disenchant them, especially if you have the tool of the trade for enchanting. The tool of the trade for enchanting means that you are not only going to acquire more of the materials when you disenchant these than you normally would, but you also have the chance to get the veiled crystals that normally only come from purples from the blues. This means that you can acquire every BFA enchanting mat from these and you will be able to do some enchanting in order to optimize your gold returns. Anything that doesn't proc blue to be disenchanted is going to be thrown back into the scrapper but these will return to you tide spray linen as well as the threads that are used for crafting the bracelets that you would otherwise have to acquire from a vendor. Now. Of course, once you've got these returns, you are simply going to craft them back into more bracelets for more chances of blue procs. Repeat this process until you have run out of Tide Spray Linen. Now once you have run out of Tide Spray Linen, your next option is going to be the crafting of BFA enchants with the materials that you have acquired. Now, this is very much subject to your realm and the capacities you have in terms of formulas. Now. I can't tell you specifically what you should and shouldn't craft with these as it is going to be realm specific as well as what you have the tier 3 recipes for that is going to be viable to make a profit margin on. But simply look through the materials you've got, what you can craft and see if there is a profit margin on it for you. This is easy to do with TSM as it will show you what has a profit margin and what does not. Now if you do not want to do this extra step and want to sell your enchanting materials simply as they are that is a valid option it's going to have a very higher sale rate as well as potentially a higher profit margin depending on what you have access to the craft it is worth looking however as when i was performing this i did find some enchants that increased my profit margin by 2000 golden enchant and i had enough to make five of them 
So that is an extra return of 10,000 gold. So please do check for yourself if enchanting is going to improve your profit margins. Now, one question I was asked when discussing this with a friend is the ability to perform this farm on a 2 by 4 basis if you are on a realm that is low pop and therefore you can't find anyone else on your realm to be able to perform the task of assembling the other group as you would be on different layers. Now, this sharding effect is actually able to be cheesed so that you can get someone from another realm to appear on your realm despite being in different groups and it's quite easy to accomplish so i thought i would as a closing thought run you through that process now all you have to do if you're unaware is find that other person and group them get yourselves to the location in question i often find myself just tagging a mob or two as it helps with not being unfazed for some reason when you separate the group but get yourself into a single group kill a couple of mobs at the location and then put yourself in the group finder to find more as if you were assembling the rest of your group at this point the leader of the group leaves party and they will still be on the same realm as the other person who is now still on that realm and also in the group finder to find more people at this point, the former leader of the group simply lists himself as group 2 and you add people and go from there. But that's going to about wrap it up for this video guys. If there's anything else that you feel that should have been in the video that hasn't been put in there, please do comment down below and I will be sure to have a look and pin your answers. If you found the video helpful, please do consider giving it a like, it helps out a great deal. And if you want to be kept up to date with any future videos that I bring out, please do consider, oh wow, please do consider subscribing to the channel. And after that little fiasco, I bid you adieu and I hope to see you in the next one. Later.